Today I'm going to talk about models for thinking and metaphors, which are a way of using models in language when you speak, thinking models. We spoke before about the way that the atom has been modeled to look like the solar system. And I mentioned that Niels Bohr developed this planetary model. Um, it was also um, Ernest Rutherford. Uh, and notice that you can really see how it works because what Rutherford had to say about the atom, trying to think about why negative charged particles just didn't collapse into the center of the atom is he had to say that you know electrons orbit the nucleus and the word orbit imports that model of the solar system because of course planets orbit the sun. Barbara Tversky has talked about modeling and how it works and she's thinking about scientific models and models of all sorts. Uh, she says models are necessary for thinking. They um, recraft information so that the mind can work with that information to understand it. She says models do more than just represent. What they do is they allow us to go further, to encourage thinking, to allow inferences, discovery, and creative leaps. A model is a thinking tool. So in language, we have models. Just when we're speaking, we create models for thinking. The theme for this section of the course is forms of thinking. And metaphor is a linguistic form. Lakoff and Johnson uh, are cognitive psychologists and linguists who wrote a very important book called Metaphors We Live By. And what this book was designed to do was to show how pervasive metaphors are in language, how pervasive this kind of modeling is something that we use when we're thinking. They say the essence of metaphor is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another. Notice that it's not just understanding, but experiencing. We actually, because of our language, because of the way we talk about things, experience the world according to these models. As we talk about metaphor, we're going to use this sort of algebraic formula, x equals y. And x will be the idea or concept that, that our thoughts are trying to grasp. And y will be the model used to understand that concept. You know that there are lots of metaphors in poetry, of course. Uh, this is Robert Burns, my love is like a red, red rose, my love is like a melody. So here's our X equals Y. His lover is like a rose. And notice he says that that's newly sprung in June. So he's thinking about his lover as fresh and young and beautiful. His lover is a sweet melody, and that's the effect that she has on him. This, a lover, a person, doesn't seem like an abstraction, but what is abstract are his feelings about her, and these models capture his feelings about that person. Here's a good metaphor. Life is a long, winding path. Notice in this image of that metaphor, there's detours that don't go anywhere. There's choices about which one to take. There's backtracking. And you can think about life in all of those kinds of terms. You can say, well, that job that I took was a detour. It isn't really what I want to do. X equals Y. Life, which is abstract and difficult to understand, is being modeled by a physical thing, a path. 
So James Geary in The Secret Life of Metaphor says, whenever we describe anything abstract, ideas, feelings, thoughts, emotions, concepts, we instinctively resort to metaphor. Now here's a, a metaphor from Romeo and Juliet. Romeo says, that light coming out of Juliet's bedroom window is the east. It's where the east where the sun rises. Juliet is the sun. Now he's really trying to understand his feelings about Juliet, not Juliet herself. There are lots of metaphors for love used all the time, and the Thought Company gives us a, a smattering of those. Mother Teresa said that love is a fruit in season at all times and within the reach of every hand. Notice that she's changed the model just a bit because <laughs> fruit isn't in season at all times. You know, blueberries come in the summer and peaches, but this is a different kind of fruit, she's saying. And sometimes apples are too high in the tree to reach, but no, this one, she's this, this kind of fruit that's love is in the reach of every hand. So Geary says that what we do is we mix and match what we know about the model. So in Shakespeare's case, the model is the sun with what we know about what it's modeling, Juliet. And it's not again, Juliet the person, it's Romeo's feelings about Juliet. So we mix and match. There are some things we take from the metaphor and some things we discard, just like Mother Teresa discarded the portion of the metaphor, fruit is love, by saying this fruit is in season all the time. So when Romeo thinks of Juliet as the sun, he thinks of her as bright, warm, glowing, not as made of noxious gases. He discards that part of the model in thinking about his love, Juliet, his love for Juliet. But the sun is also the source of life. Without it, the world would die. Everyone in the world would die. And one would hope that in being in love with somebody, you would discard this part of the metaphor. You would say the sun is the source of life, but this person is not the source of my life. Unfortunately, Romeo did not discard that part of the metaphor, right? Because when he thinks she's dead, he kills himself. Many, many poems have been written describing women in terms of beautiful things, commodities really, often coral, very bony, right? And pearls, uh, very round, are used to describe women's features. Uh, her teeth are like pearls. Now, you wouldn't want to take the round part of the pearls. People with round teeth would look kind of silly. What you want is the white, lustrous, shiny part of pearls. So you're taking some parts of the model and applying it and discarding others. Somebody in the 16th century made this very funny picture of what a woman who's described by all these poems would actually look like. And she's a monster. Look, her breasts are globes. That looks terrible. And especially look at her mouth. Her lips are coral. Well, coral is bony and pearls are round. This mouth is disgusting, right? So what this um, artist has done is to sort of literalize the model and not just pull from it the pretty things or the things that apply to the model, the redness of the coral, the white lustrousness of the pearls. No, they, they haven't just taken that, they've taken the whole thing. And you can see that that doesn't work. Here's another metaphor in a poem. And the underlying metaphor here is that life is a journey. You can see miles to go before I sleep. Now, the way that we know that this is a metaphor, because it's somebody talking who's stopped by the woods uh, on a snowy evening and his horse is, you know, bucking, wanting to go because it's cold. And he says, he looks into the woods longingly and says, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep. And this 
promises here indicates that what comes next will be a metaphor modeling promises. Also, the repetition of the line, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. This instance of it is literal. Well, I've got a long way to go before I get home. This instance of it is metaphorical. Sleep. It turns sleep into a kind of death. Miles into obligations going miles on life's journey uh, is, is fraught with all the obligations that you have to keep, the promises. Lakoff and Johnson, however, argue that metaphors are not just confined to poetry. They are reflected in our everyday language by a wide variety of expressions. And this was revolutionary in cognitive science what people realized is that we are modeling the world in every sentence we utter using metaphors. And here are some examples that Lakoff and Johnson give at the beginning of their book. Argument is war. <clears throat> and you know you've said before, he just attacked me for no reason, right? Well, and he didn't physically attack you. He argumentatively attacked you. You've also, I'm sure, said, well, I lost that argument. Then in that case, arguments are about winning or losing a battle. One of the most significant metaphors they uncover is time is money. Can you spend some time with me? Spending is about money. This gadget will save you hours He's living on borrowed time. Is that worth your while? All of these things are modeling time as money. And we don't notice these kinds of metaphors in language, in fact, before the existence of wage labor. You know, when there were serfs and slaves, nobody had to pay anybody to work for them. But once there were hourly labor, laborers with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, you did have to pay people an hourly wage. And people started to really thinking about time as money. Notice this one too. You need to budget your time. How many times have you said that to yourself or other people? Um, we're going to come back to budget in a minute because budget is just a literal word, right? Meaning... Uh, some kind of <clears throat> plan for spending. And um, it's about money, so it's a metaphor here in the context of time. But if you were talking about uh, accounting, it would be literal, you would think. But we're going to come back to that. So get off my back in that sentence, which I'm sure you've uttered to somebody at some point in your life, criticism, their criticism of you, is a heavy burden. That's the metaphor at work there. I feel worthless. If a friend says that, maybe you should point out to them that the metaphor that that idea and feeling is based on is that a person is a commodity and a person is not a commodity. A person isn't worth or not worth anything. A person just is. So you can see how these metaphors not only serve as conscious models that we use when we're writing poetry, but unconscious models that are at work in our language. And if you find that model and look at it, you can question it, right? You can say, well, what, why would a person be worth something or not worth something? That's like something you could buy. I'm not something you could buy. I'm a person. Okay, remember I said budget, when you use it in talking about, you know, accounting is literal. Well, it wasn't. It was at first a metaphor during the Middle Ages. And you can see here, Emmy, um, medieval, right? In medieval language, it meant a pouch, bag, or wallet. 
And up into the Renaissance, you can see people using um, budget to mean purse. Now, often it had th things in it other than money, it had nails in it, Moxon says in his mechanical exercises. But it also had money in it. And Haywood says, a Renaissance playwright, your wealth lies in your brains, not in your budgets or purses. So originally that literal pouch or bag was a literal thing. And somebody used the metaphor for it. You can imagine somebody being at market and they are trying to buy something and they're negotiating with a seller and the seller says it's $7. And they open their budget, their purse, and say, pull out the money in it and say, I've only got $5. Uh, that's all that's in my budget, right? So then that becomes metaphorically applied to a budget that indicates what you have to spend. Lakoff and Johnson argue that all metaphors, all language is originally derived from metaphors. And you can see this over and over again. And you can see it when you look at the etymologies of words, which is what I'm looking at here. This is uh, from the Oxford English Dictionary. Now there's lots of metaphors used in technology to describe both the internet and information. So I've listed some articles here, and then I've listed what they say. Look how the internet is being understood metaphorically. Now to be fair, Vannevar Bush wasn't actually talking about the internet. It didn't exist when he wrote, <coughs> nor computers. Um, he was talking about a proposed computer that he called the Memex. It's an amazing article because it's so predictive of what eventually developed. It's in the Atlantic and you can read it if you want to. He says, the internet is, his memex, a web of trails that you can follow through the mountain of research. So information is a mountain. It's just overwhelming. It's this huge mountain of things that you have to to find your way through, and the way you find it is through trails. That has been uh, kind of literalized in the idea of breadcrumbs that you see at the bot bottom of the page in web pages, right? The breadcrumbs take you back to the main branch of your trail. And remember, what we read in Nicholas Carr is Google making us stupid. He talks about reading as deep diving into the sea of words. So information here is being figured as the sea or an ocean. The internet, he, he rides on the internet like a jet ski and it zips along the surface. So the internet is this fast way of getting across information surface, uh, across the surface of it, not delving deep out, down into it. Another, uh, an Edge article, and I've given you the link to all those Edge articles about the how the internet is changing the way we think. And he says that the internet is the mother of all lists. So information is a bunch of lists. And mother, that is a person. You can see his metaphor continues much later in the essay when he says that the internet is a system that infinitely breeds new realities. So a mother who gives birth to things. John Markoff in um, an edge piece says, the net skipped lightly across national bond boundaries and seems to have a mind of its own. Well, here, we're turning the internet into a person who can skip and think. They, the person has a mind. This is um, a metaphorical technique known as personification. You turn something into a person. And we constantly talk about the data deluge, right? So information is a flood. I wanna show you something though about the history of data revolutions 
Washington Irving, he wrote the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon in 1819. You remember him. He's the author who wrote about Rip Van Winkle and the legends of Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Horseman. Well, in this essay called The Mutability of Literature, uh, which is written in 1819, and the steam engine is just beginning to be used on printing at this moment. And he longs for a time when there wasn't a printing press, when works had to be transcribed by hand, by monks. And he says, you know, then authorship was limited. Not everybody could publish everything very quickly. He says, to these circumstances, we can attribute the fact that we have not been inundated by the intellect of antiquity. Well, inundated is about flooding, that the fountains of thought, water again. So water, the, the fountains of thought feed into, but may be overwhelmed by this flood of information. And he actually calls printing a deluge, just as we call the internet a data deluge. So <clears throat> for your readings this week, try to pay attention to the metaphors or models that people are using to describe experiences and try to think about what is entailed, like how much of that model applies and what doesn't imply as you read. Thank you.